All right, you guys ready to go? Awesome. Okay, so welcome to the strategic design workshop. We're going to have kind of two sections to this workshop. We're going to be talking about preparing for the season and some key tips regarding FRC robots that I'm hoping you'll remember going into the 2017 build season. And then we're going to talk about the build and competition season schedule and some key elements to the schedule that 1678 follows that I'm hoping you might be able to glean some, uh, some knowledge from and maybe some advice. Um, to kick things off, I just want to introduce myself. Um, I am Mike Crescetto. I'm the lead technical mentor and drive coach for the Citrus Circuits, Team 1678. Um, this is going to be my 14th season in FRC. I did ten, uh, four years as a student, and then this is going to be my 10th year mentoring and my 10th year with 1678. Um, my, as a, my day job is a mechanical engineer at a company called DMG Mori in Davis. I design uh, large machine tools, uh, horizontal milling machines. And the important thing I really want to emphasize is in FRC, there are a lot of really brilliant people, especially some brilliant mentors like Austin Shu and Adam Hurd that I've gotten the pleasure to meet over the last uh, 10 years or so. But I am not that smart of a guy, all right? Uh, and I really can't emphasize that enough. I was an okay student. I kind of scraped through college, all right? I, I don't have a lot of very vast technical like um, epiphanies and uh, knowledge bases or anything like that. But uh, I have a couple of just key rules that I follow when uh, 16 Samuels is building robots, and I think it served the team well, our students well, and I want to share those things with you right now. Um, but I can't emphasize that enough. I'm not just, I'm not some like guru or anything like that. Um, we're going to talk about the training a little bit and uh, things to keep in mind when it comes to training and our approach to all these things, drivetrain design, mechanism design, uh, electrical and wiring tips, and then also uh, like programming things that you want to focus on. You need to steal from the best and invent the rest. That's golden rule number three. We're going to get back around to golden rules one and two later. All right. But you aren't in FRC to reinvent the wheel. Okay. And I hope you follow something like steal the best, invent the rest. 1678 students all know this motto. What do we do? We steal the best and we invent the rest. Um, get familiar with past games and teams, uh, robots from past games. All right. Get familiar with the games going back. I mean, I would go back all the way to 04 at least and learn about what the games that were played, how did teams play them, what robots did well, um, because a lot of the games will be similar. To give you some examples, in 2007 and 2011, 2007, the game was? Oh, no, not Logomotion, Rack and Roll, right? And 2011 was Logomotion. I, I understand the confusion, though, because they were like the exact freaking same game, all right? You had three rungs. One was about two feet off the ground. One was about five feet off the ground. One was about eight feet off the ground. And you had to put these inflatable tubes on the rungs. I mean, I couldn't believe when they came out with 2011 how similar it was to 2007. Let me give you an example of how similar it was. In 2007, probably hands down, the best grabber of that year was on Team 100's robot, Woodside, Woodside out of uh, the Bay Area, all right? 2011 comes around, and I was a senior in high school in 2007, and I remember Team 100's robot. We were on alliance with them at SVR, and I loved that robot, and I loved that claw. I loved that claw that grabbed the tubes. And so when it came to 2011, I'm with 1678, and we're thinking through, well, what do we do to grab this tube? Well, these tubes are like the same size as 2007, and 100 had a great intake that year. Let's go check out what they did. So what we did was we went on 100's website. We went to 2007 Team Pictures, right? We found a great side view of their robot, and we blew up the image of the claw until it was about the size of real life. We, put, we projected that onto the screen, and then we put a piece of metal up and traced out the outline of the claw, put a couple holes where we need to drill holes for the bearings, and then we took that off, cut that out on the bandsaw, and then we had our intake for 2011. I kid you not. And that was the first year we won a regional ever. The team didn't get past the quarterfinals until 2011 where we won the Sacramento Regional. All right, We straight up just <clears throat> traced out the intake from Team 100 2007, did a couple small tweaks, and then we had our intake for 2011. So steal from the best, invent the rest is a mantra to follow in all aspects of your team, mechanical design especially, because games are very similar and there's a lot of things, lessons you can learn from past years that will apply to the current year. Drivetrain design. I'm going to go case study here. I need you guys to uh, look at these robots for a second, OK? Study them. You guys are paying attention? OK, next slide. Look at these robots for a second. All right, focus. Look closely. OK, maybe back to these ones for a second. And forward again. OK? OK, 
Before I ask you this question, the answer is not blue, all right? What do you notice that's the same with all of these robots? <laughs> what? Drivetrain's exactly the same in all of these robots. Why? Because it works. Because it works, all right? All of these robots that I just showed you, one at least one regional, all right? Some of these robots, two of them on the screen right now, are world championship robots. They won the world championship, 2014, 2011, all right? They all have almost the exact same drivetrain, minus the, uh, you know, maybe eight or uh, six wheels and uh, the size of the wheels a little bit. But same principle every year. Why? Because it works, okay? So in talking about that, what are your options? Well, what we just looked at, we call tank drive, all right? You got wheels powered on the right, wheels powered on the left. It turns like a tank, kind of drives like a tank. Uh, those can be like four, six, or eight, or even 10. Six and 78 had 10 wheels this last year. A lot of teams had 10 wheels. Um, another option is swerve drive, way complicated. Don't do it. Octanum, um, also complicated. Don't do it. Mechanum, please don't do it. Omni drives. <laughs> Please don't do it. All right, I'm going to sound, I, I sound, I mean, I, I know I sound a little blunt and a little bit uneducated by just being like, well, don't do it. I, mean, I, I, mean, I don't even understand how to build one of those things. I'm not even going to try it. Um, what you want to be build, building is a six wheel tank robot. That is golden rule number one. So we've hit two of them already within 10 minutes of the presentation. Golden rule number one, build a tank drive robot. Okay. Preferably six wheels. Even more preferably, the kit bot. All right, build the kit bot. Come on in, 973. Take a seat. Stand in another corner besides that one. Awesome. Um, build a tank drive robot. That is golden rule number one. 1678 always builds tank drive. We uh, pretty much always build West Coast. Uh, even our interface to the ball shifters was the same as last year. I mean, we pretty much had the exact same drivetrain with different size wheels this year as we did last year. Um, why? Because it's a proven design. Every year it just works. Of course, we have to change a little, a couple things here and there, but if you start knowing that you're going to build a tank drive, it simplifies the discussion and that's going to affect the build season schedule, which we talk about a little bit later. Um, there's also, it, it tends to be a fairly lightweight drivetrain, especially if you don't have a two speed. Um, there's room for electronics board right in the middle of the drivetrain, which is great for keeping all your electronics, including your battery, really nice and low and clean. Um, and then there's also space along all the rails to mount whatever superstructure you need, which is very convenient to have basically a, a square, and then you get to mount things up from the square. It can be pretty easy to do. So, um, and the kit bot is actually fairly easy to mount things to. It's not the greatest, but it's not terrible either. Um, that is golden rule number one. Please take that back with you. If you can agree, as a team before build season starts that you're gonna build a tank drive robot, all right? You are, I, I'd say you at least have a 50%, you have a 50% greater chance of winning the events that you go to. I, I have no scientific evidence to back that, but I'm just gonna say it. You have a better chance of winning your regional if you decide right now as a team, as a leadership team, that you're gonna build a tank drive no matter what the game is, all right? You will save yourself time and energy and frustration down the road. Please do it, build a tank drive. Moving on, mechanism design. So everyone's building what? Tank drive. Tank drive. I'm glad you guys all agree already. This is fantastic. All right, mechanism design. Uh, a couple basic ways to power a mechanism I wanted to go over real quick. Um, the two basic ways to power any given mechanism that you're designing are motors and pneumatics. Um, teams, I, I generally think both are great and they both have their uses. So I'm not going to poo-poo one or the other. Uh, motors generally require gearbox to go along with them. Uh, the gearbox can weigh, uh, you know, somewhat amount, but there's lots of great off the shelf options for gearboxes. Now back in my day, 2004, all right, we didn't have all these fancy Versa planetaries. All right. But now you have this Versa planetary and if your shooter is going too fast, you just change out the three to one for a 10 to one. And now you just reduced your shooter speed by like, you know, 300% and now your shots are going in the goal. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you can do really easily with things like Versa planetaries and other stock gearboxes that you couldn't do 10 years ago. So you can use that to your advantage. Motors give you the ability on certain mechanisms to give you variable movement. So like if you have an arm and you want a bunch of different positions for the arm, a motor powered arm is probably a good way to go because you can lift the arm up and then maybe stop here and then lift and stop there. You can have some variable motion, but that's also adds complexity. So those can be harder to control. Our arm this year weighed 50 pounds and it was a pain to program. I don't think we would do what we just did again. Um, pneumatics. Pneumatics are great because they're super simple and they get you from point A to point B and they don't fuss around. All right. So if you want, for example, is anyone from, oh yeah, uh, 5677, right? 
I was just marveling at your guys' robot uh, maybe just an hour ago, right? And I was looking specifically at your guys' intake. And on your intake, you have these two pneumatic cylinders that uh, extend and the intake comes down to like the perfect height every time, right? You don't have to fuss around with any control loops or anything like that to get the intake to exactly where you want it. You fine tuned it before you put the robot out on the field and every time the pneumatics extend, they go to the right height. Very simple, A to B movement, that's awesome. Highly recommend pneumatics for things that only need two positions, okay? Pneumatics are great for things like that. They're simple, easy to control, do not require all these fancy control algorithms that you can sink a lot of time into, okay? And they're also, it's, like I said, it's very repeatable. It's always gonna go from point A to point B unless something breaks. Um, for your mechanism shapes, just in general, keep in mind that you wanna Keep things simple. Kiss is keep it simple, stupid. <coughs> keep it simple, silly, if you want to be a little nicer about it. Um, you want to minimize the degrees of freedom on your mechanism. So if you got to lift this, um, let's say you got to lift this, whatever this thing is, a case, from like the table up to five feet above the table, the easiest way with the minimum amount of degrees of freedom is maybe some linear actuator or something like that that just takes them from point A to point B in a straight line. My arm is an example of a very fancy uh, multiple degrees of freedom system where I have my elbow, this is my elbow, I keep mixing that up. This is my elbow, this is my shoulder, this is my wrist, and they're all working in concert to make this happen, but that's very complicated to do with an actual robot. So try to minimize your degrees of freedom and uh, simplify things where possible. Keep your center of gravity really low. Uh, teams that don't feel the burn when they go forward and then maybe they switch direction, they go backwards and all of a sudden they're upside down. Everyone's sad. Maybe a kid's crying in the corner, all right? Don't build a high center of gravity. Um, inside the frame perimeter whenever possible, um, keep things inside so they don't get broken. 2014 is a great example of robots getting destroyed because they had weak stuff outside the frame perimeter. Um, we're gonna talk about the full thought process with mechanism design. So um, when you're designing, like let's say a, um, a robot to score a ball in, our, in the 2016 game, okay? When you're designing that robot, the tendency is just to think about how you're gonna shoot the ball in the goal, okay? The tendency is just to think about, okay, I wanna get the ball into the goal, so I need to design some sort of wheeled shooter pitching machine to get it there. Um, it's really important that when you're evaluating your mechanism design, you go through the entire process to score that ball, not just the end, pro not just the scoring the ball at the end. So you need to think about how are you gonna acquire the ball? How are you gonna manipulate the ball inside your robot? Are you gonna store it somewhere in the robot and how are you gonna do that? If you have to lift up a game object to get it somewhere, like you had to lift up the tubes in 2011, how are you gonna lift that tube up? Um, and then how are you gonna position it, align it to whatever you're trying to score on? And then finally, how are you gonna release it, either with a shooter or like a claw that lets go or something like that. But you have to think through the whole workflow of this game object from beginning to end. I'll give you a really good example of when a lot of teams miss the mark as far as this whole workflow, okay? 2013, what was the game? Ultimate Ascent, Ultimate Ascent all right? The game was a Frisbee game, all right? You had to score these Frisbees into these goals that were maybe like seven or eight feet off the ground. It was actually a lot of fun, and it was a lot of fun to see these robots shooting Frisbees, you know, halfway across the field at, you know, 20, 30 miles an hour, maybe, fa I don't know, maybe faster. Um, but it was, it was a really fun game. A lot of fun seeing these Frisbees flying. The saddest part, though, was not teams missing their shots, but was teams not being able to take shots in the first place. And here's why. Because all the Frisbees were behind the human player station, all right? And the human players had to shove the Frisbees through these slots that were at like a 30 degree slope into the field, okay? So the field had these borders and the human players would take a stack of four Frisbees and they could like shove the Frisbees through the slot and then hopefully the robot was on the other side to receive it. Now, a lot of teams didn't even read the rules about how the Frisbees were entered into the field. They just designed these fancy smancy shooters, all right? And they get to the event and then they realize, oh wait, the Frisbees are getting shoved through this slot and we don't know how to get a Frisbee from the slot. So they would design like these like funnels on the top of their robot to like catch the Frisbees, but they never really tested them. And what you would find is when you shove the Frisbees through the slot, they would flip over on their way out, okay? 
and then they're like they're like saying a quick prayer before they like drop the frisbee through the slot and then it flips over upside down jams up their frisbee shooter and they can't score frisbees the rest of the match i cannot tell you how common it was it was so sad to see the same teams match after match saying the same prayers shoving the same frisbee through the slot and then watching it get jammed up the first time they load a frisbee and then they can't score for the rest of the match they had a great shooter but they spent almost zero time thinking about how they were going to acquire the frisbee which is what caused them to not be effective for the entire match. So you have to think from beginning to end, how are you gonna acquire it, manipulate it, um, store it, align it, and shoot it, okay? These are really important. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of those. Acquiring, the acquisition zone. This is a buzzword, but it's really important to consider what is your robot's acquisition zone when it comes to acquiring a game element. Um, a great example I liked, this is how hard it is to drive an FRC robot, all right? Um, so it's like me playing darts, okay? And I'm over here, and Gemma over there is the dartboard. Hi, Gemma, okay? And uh, let's see, uh, Buck over there, all right? He's gonna be the one aiming me, all right? I'm gonna close my eyes, spin around three times, and then Buck's gonna tell me left, right, all right, now throw the dart, right? There's no way Buck can tell me with my eyes closed how to line the dart to hit Gemma, all right? It's impossible. From the angle, he has no way to do it, all right? That's what it's like driving an FRC robot. That robot's 50 feet away from you, all right? And you're trying to pick up this 10-inch diameter boulder, all right? And if you design an intake that's exactly 10 inches wide for a 10-inch boulder, you have left yourself with no margin for error for the driver to try to pick up that boulder. No margin for error. So teams like 5677, they make these intakes that are really fancy. Instead of just designing an intake that's 10 inches wide to go through the slot, they have these mechanism wheels that are actually more like 25 inches wide. And the mechanism wheels, when they touch the ball, they'll center the ball automatically and then bring it into the robot. So with the mechanism wheels, they developed a larger acquisition zone, which means the driver has a better chance of picking up the boulder faster. And that makes their whole cycle faster because uh, if, if every one of these steps has a time associated with it. It takes you five seconds to acquire a ball. It takes you a couple seconds to manipulate it inside the robot. It takes you a couple seconds to lift it up. It takes you a couple seconds to position your robot to line up to score a goal. And then it takes you maybe half a second to release the ball. You have to add up all those times and that's a cycle. And maybe those times add up to 45 seconds. You're only scoring three balls in a match. Everyone see how the math adds up there? It takes you 20 seconds to acquire a ball and you know, 25 seconds to do the rest of it, right? 45 seconds, you're only gonna be able to do that process three times in a match. And frankly, that might not be fast enough to get what you wanna get done. So it's important that you think through every one of these steps in the process and increasing your acquisition zone is a big part of that. So please, please focus on that. Uh, golden rule number two, I call it the rolly grabber, all right? It, I, it's more technically a continuous intake where basically you turn on the intake before you get to whatever you're trying to intake and then right when you get to it it magically comes into your robot and you own it all right uh 118 has another way to put it they say if you touch it you own it okay basically means if you get to the game element you own the game element um what, what I mean by that is if you always have an intake on, you touch the game element, you bring it in. The other option is like if a team has a, like there's a bit, let's, let's say it's 2014, you got these really big ball, um, like aerobics balls, right? And you're trying to pick one of those up. If you have a claw, right? And your claw is open, you have no rolly grabbers or anything like that. You drive up to the ball. You got to time your claw closing to exactly when you get to the ball, right? And let's say your operator like, blinks and misses it, right? The robot hits the ball, the ball bounces away, they close the claw and they miss the ball and the ball goes rolling away. Then they gotta open the claw again, chase it down again, try to grab it again. Um, that's what more of the single intake style is. Rolly grabber, you just turn it on, get to the ball, it comes in. People are building rolly grabbers all the time now, so I don't think this is, this needs to be hit too hard, but we're gonna do one more case study, okay? And I think you might see where this is going. Okay, pay attention. Okay, and keep in mind the answer is still not blue. What do you notice that's the same in all these? What? what? Same number, okay. What? Anyone? anyone? Rolly grabbers, okay. Look at, look at this. I mean, rolly grabbers all over the place. Look at it. It's hard to see, but there's a rolly grabber in here to pick up the soccer ball. But look at this. A rolly grabber for Frisbees. A rolly grabber for big aerobics balls. They, use, they even use rolly grabbers for totes. A uh, rolly grabber for 
Uh, well, oh, balls, that was boulders again. A rolling grabber for inner tubes. They copied Team 100 also, by the way, um, which is great. Um, now, I'm going to go back a little bit. Here, 2009, rolling grabbers to pick up the lunacy balls. 2008, rolling grabbers to pick up the big track balls. 2007. That's not a grab ball. That's not rolling. Who said that? That's not rolling. I know. Does anyone know anything about the 2007 robot? It's the first time they lost SVR, and actually the only time they lost SVR was 2007. They didn't build a rolly grabber, they lost SVR. And in 2010, they have rolly grabbers. Yes. Are you convinced already? Yeah? Rolly grabbers, okay? Rolly grabbers, continuous intake it. Touch it and own it. Touch it and own it. That's really important for your intakes. Okay, device alignment. This is something I want to hit really quickly. This year, I'm just going to say this year was really hard, all right? If this year was very hard to score a ball. But there were a couple ways to make it a little bit easier. Some teams figured it out. Um, a couple teams had what we called the um, what is it? we called the batter shot, right? Where they drove up to the tower, they put their bumpers against the tower, and then they just shot the ball, and uh, most likely it went in because they, one, it was a close shot, but two, if they squared up their bumpers onto the wall, they were making rough, they were taking the same shot every time. All right, and that helped a lot with the consistency. In 2013, if anyone remembers that game, actually 2014 is a better example. Uh, teams like Cheesy Poofs in 2014, they would just drive their robots straight into the low goal, ram it at you know ramming speed or whatever you call it, right? And then they just shoot the ball when they, once they hit the low goal. But they're always in the same spot every time, so they didn't have to futz around with am I too close? Am I too far? Let me adjust a little bit because if you did that in aerial assault, you were going to get hit three times and hit off course anyway. So that low goal was really key for them. Uh, the batter shot's a great example from this year. You get to a known location and it makes your alignment a lot faster. So look for things like that in the game where you can say, well, what if we just shot from this one spot every time, every match? Can we pull that off, right? If you can and the answer is yes, maybe that's a good direction to go because it's going to make your design a lot better and a, well, a lot easier. And it's going to make quick alignment, which is key to scoring a lot of, uh, a lot of points in a match. Hey, here's 973's robot. Uh, balls are a common game element. You saw it last year. You probably won't, maybe you'll see it next year. I have no idea. Uh, tubes are another common game element. I'm just going through a couple things and the picture's not here, but Frisbees, maybe, maybe the Frisbees will make a comeback this year. I have no idea. Um, electrical pneumatic tips really fast. Um, for electrical wiring, it's really important that you do this right and wire your robots cleanly. All right. Um, I mentioned, uh, holy cows over here, right? Um, th their robots have some of the most impeccable wiring you'll see in FRC, um, but it has more function than just looking really good, all right? And I want to go through that really quick. Uh, a brief story, in 2013, uh, 1678, for the first time, made it to Einstein. Uh, it, was, it was a crazy run. We're in, I think, the second, maybe the third, I think it was the second semifinal match on Einstein, and we're going to shoot another uh, magazine of Frisbees, and the robot just stops in the middle of the field, right? And we're like halfway through, we're like, oh my gosh, what happened? Oh my gosh. And uh, 40 seconds later, it comes back on and we finish the rest of the match. We barely hang. Um, we lose the match though. And we go back afterwards and we're like, oh crap, what happened? It died for 40 seconds. What could that be, right? Well, it turns out that the wiring that year was just abysmal. It was just a rat's nest in the middle of the robot underneath the mechanism, okay? And apparently nobody thought down, nobody thought to strap down the compressor at all. So the compressor just having a great time running around inside the robot, right? And it decided, it decided to bump its buddy, the radio and unplug the power for a split second, which caused a radio reboot, which meant that we were down for 40 seconds. And I think that cost us that second match. And uh, I think we could have taken 469 in the finals if we had made it that far, but uh, we lost in the semis. And it was partly because we had bad wiring. So the next year, uh, we did not repeat our mistakes and we mounted down the compressor, but have clean wiring. It makes it easy to trace problems and uh, avoid failures like I talked about in 2013. Programming. So um, part of the strategic aspect of programming is there's a lot of points to be made in autonomous. So I highly encourage your team to start learning how to program autonomous modes if you haven't investigated that already. Um, it, there's a lot of examples of teams scoring a lot of points or even some points in autonomous, but the saddest thing is when teams score no points in autonomous and just sit there. I mean, even last year, all you need to be able to do is drive straight for five seconds and you were able to score points in last year's game. But there's a lot of teams that haven't even tried programming autonomous before they get to the build season. So give it a shot right now. You got two and a half months until kickoff. Give it a shot. Program in autonomous mode. See how it works out. Learn something new. It'll pay off when you get to build season. Um, 
A couple other things to know about that could really boost your team's competitiveness. There, there are four things that I really like our programming teams to be able to know how to do. The first one is to be able to drive precisely and autonomous using a combination of encoders and gyros. There's quite a few different ways to do this, but when push comes to shove, every autonomous mode every year requires a robot to move from point A to point B and maybe to point C and point D after that. And you have to do that consistency, consistently. So you're gonna need some closed loop control, including encoders and gyros. So I encourage you right now to start learning how to use encoders and gyros in your drivetrains and you're going to build a tank drive, right? So you, if you build a tank drive next year, you can just use the code, adjust a couple variables, and now you have precision autonomous driving for the, for the competition season done even before you get there. And then make sure to post your code online so you're not violating first rules. Okay, uh, camera alignment is another thing that happened. It was key this year. Sometimes it doesn't play a big factor. 2016, obviously a big factor. If your team can play around with camera alignment before the build season, you'll be in good shape. Train on stuff like that. Uh, if you're feeling adventurous, train on how to control uh, more sophisticated arms and elevators and stuff like that with PID loops um, and, uh, and, and control systems. A uh, simple controller that I can recommend for shooter wheels in particular, like this year and every other year, uh, if you have something to shoot, typically a shooter wheel is a great way to do it. And a simple control uh, algorithm for a shooter wheel is called Bang Bang. And the simple way to explain Bang Bang is if you're slower than you want to be, turn the motors on full speed. If you're faster than you want to be, turn the motors off. And then as you keep doing that and refreshing at a, a fairly fast refresh rate, you'll have a constant speed or more or less. It's a great way to do things. Uh, if you have questions about that, you can ask a programmer on my team. Please don't ask me. I won't be able to explain it better than I just did. Um, okay, that's preseason training. Those, those are all things that I'm hoping you can learn about now, get familiar with now, study other robots, Give your programming team some practice with autonomous routines. Uh, decide on a drivetrain design now and not come kick off. All right. I can tell you 1678 already knows what we're going to build for our drivetrain. We have no idea what the game is going to be, but we know we're building a six wheel drivetrain, maybe eight. Um, build season overview. Okay. Uh, when, we, when we talk about planning the build season, it's really important that you plan out an accelerated schedule. Okay. Um, students, I'm going to be honest for a second. I mean, your teachers probably know because you procrastinate sometimes, or, or maybe a lot. But when it comes to FRC, students will almost always assume they have more time to get something done than they actually do. Um, and then I have bad news for mentors too. You know, mentors were not immune to this either. You know, I, I often have rose-colored glasses, and I think that we're going to get X, Y, and Z done, and we barely get X done in the long run. So. Um, it's really important to set a schedule for yourself. So if you're not setting the build season schedule for your whole build season, start setting one now. All right, meet with your team leadership, decide when you're gonna have things done. Um, but also set an accelerated schedule, reach a little bit and push yourself to get things done faster because it's gonna pay off to have that extra time down the road. I'm gonna go through 1678's build season schedule briefly, all right? Week one, so we're talking kickoff, day one through day three is our brainstorming session, all right? And we're gonna hit the stop button and focus on brainstorming for a while because brainstorming is by far the most critical period to your team's build season, all right? If you do days one through three right, you give yourself a great chance of doing well in the competition season. If your team falls flat in days one through three and doesn't hold to a solid methodology of designing and brainstorming your robot, you guys will have a crazy time trying to reel back from a mismanaged uh, days one through three. And again, it's not about having great ideas, it's about managing things right. And we're gonna go through exactly what 1678 does for the first three days. This is down to the hour. We know exactly what we're gonna do on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday down to the hour. And I'm gonna explain it right now, okay? Step one, everyone is gonna read the rules and pass a rules test, okay? Everybody on our team reads the rules in its entirety and passes a rules test on the rules. Our experience, our veteran students just generate a rules test on Google Docs and then they test the whole team on those rules, okay? Um, and no one is allowed to move past the rules test stage to the next period of our brainstorming session without passing the rules test, all right? That is a hard, fast rule. So if you're on 1678, Get ready for the rules test, all right? Um, I encourage you to have some sort of way to objectively measure each member of your team's knowledge base of the current year's game, because if you don't, they are likely to suggest ideas during your brainstorming sessions that go against the rules or ignore the rules completely, and they will not be productive towards your discussions. Make sure, I, 
one of my big pet peeves is the teams that say, oh, we have our rules expert. He's the kid in the corner that reads things and we just come up with the good ideas, right? But it's like playing soccer without knowing the rules, right? And then you play your first game and you go to try to pick up the soccer ball with your hands. I mean, you're gonna look like an idiot, right? Everybody else knows you're an idiot because you don't know the rules, all right? Read the rules, know them backwards and forwards, everyone on your team. This isn't a role for one person on your team. Everybody on our team needs to know all the rules before going into the next step of the brainstorming session. So we usually have our rules test done around one o'clock or so on Saturday, maybe two o'clock, everyone's passed the rules test. Um, around one o'clock, right after lunch on Saturday, we're going into step two. Step two is answering the what questions. What is a robot gonna do? Some people call it strategy. Um, we call it the what's, all right? Um, what will the robot actually do in a match? Um, so we will uh, first break everyone up and on their own, they have half hour to come up with what they think the robot should do. So 2016, should the robot be able to uh, like cross the class C defenses and the class D defenses? Should the robot be scoring in the low goal? Should it be scoring in the high goal? Um, maybe what do we want an ideal match to look like? Do we want our robot scoring balls the whole time? Do we want to be picking up balls from the human player? Do we want to be picking up balls from the midline? Um, those are all great things. What is our robot going to do actually on the field? All right. There's a big difference though between the what and the hows. Okay. The hows are we're going to build a, uh, a shooter wheel and it's going to have 5,000 RPMs and then we're going to have a couple rolly grabbers and uh, we're going to have an elevator system in the middle of the robot. Those are all how questions and those are big no-nos during the what portion of our brainstorming process. So after each of our students have come up with their own what's, they all have a chance to uh, share. So we give every student a minute or so, a minute or two to present in front of the whole team what they wrote down on their little pieces of paper. And a lot of the ideas will be fairly similar, but we give everyone a chance to express their ideas. If if a student is explaining their strategy, their answers to the what's, and then they start talking about the hows, I carry a taboo buzzer with me and I buzz them. I say, no, stop, stop. You're not allowed to talk about the hows right now. We are in the what's and only the what's because our goal at the end of step two is to have a list of criteria that the robot must do and only that criteria, okay? So for example, in 2016, uh, some of the things that our criteria had on it. We were gonna shoot into the high goal from defenses one, two, uh, three, and four. We were gonna be able to shoot from like the outer works in that area. We were gonna be able to cross defenses A, B, and D. And then uh, we were gonna be able to go underneath the low bar. And then uh, one of our criteria was the robot had to be able to do a two ball autonomous. Somehow, it had to be able to do a two ball autonomous. Um, Another criteria was it had to be able to shoot over a full height blocker. That was something that we had written down on the whiteboard. Needs to be able to shoot over four foot, six inch defense, okay? So these are all criteria of the design. They, none of them are housed. We don't say how we're gonna do that. Just this robot, this robot box is gonna magically be able to do this list of things. But obviously it would not be wise to say a robot's gonna do everything. So you need to make some decisions during that. What has, what has a point value, what doesn't? We thought the two ball auto was gonna be worth it, even though it, we tried to do it all season and we finally got it working at the very end, but um, it's really important to set your what's first because what you're gonna do is you're gonna set your whole list of criteria, you're gonna white it, white it, you're gonna write it out on the whiteboard, okay? And then you're gonna go into step three, which is answering the how questions. And now again, just like in the what's, we break our whole team up, everybody takes a piece of paper and starts to sketch out some of the mechanism, robot shapes. What you know, like how do you think the robot's gonna accomplish our strategy, all right? And then everybody comes back together and presents their house. But I still have my taboo buzzer because occasionally here's what's happening, what'll happen. So we set up our strategy and one of our strategy points was that we're not gonna try the class C defense, all right? We're just not gonna do it, all right? It's not something we think is worth the points. It's gonna take more time. It's susceptible to defense. We're gonna skip it, okay? And this kid comes up, I don't know, maybe, you know, Jack comes up and he's like, all right, I'm really excited for my robot design. You can check it out here. It accomplishes everything on the list. And then it's even better because it's able to open up the Sally port, right? And then I slam my buzzer. I'm like, no, we are not doing the Sally port. We already wrote it down. We're never going to do the Sally port this season. Don't even try. We're moving on beyond that. I'm serious. We set that, we set that strategy day two so that for the rest of the season, we don't futz around with things that aren't strategically valuable based off our game analysis days one and two. Okay, we move on, we set our direction and we move forward. So as a team, we answer, well, we come up with a lot of ideas for the hows. Some of them are more set in stone, but there's a lot of ideas we need to prototype. So I'm gonna go back to the schedule. Once we have our list of hows, we go into prototyping phase. 
And uh, we, go th we try to prototype all the mechanisms, especially the mechanisms that we're not sure how they're going to work. And we need to do some kind of inventing and you know, creativity to get, to get something working, let's say for like the shooter this year, or climbing. We had no idea if a robot would have enough power to climb. Uh, so we had to like jerry-rig one of our past year's robots to lift itself up and prove that it could pick itself up. A lot of stuff like that. So that's all like kind of what goes in the prototyping. Uh, but um, one thing that isn't really noted in here, but should be mentioned, on day three, our drivetrain design is done. So our West Coast Drive is completely designed by day three. Um, we know we're building a West Coast Drive. We know we're going to use a VexPro ball shifter two-speed. Um, we know we're going to use some assortment of wheels and 25 chain and West Coast products bearing blocks. I mean, we do that stuff every year. And so the students just make Monday a late night. Uh, we pick a drivetrain shape that meets the rules and we think will be compatible with whatever we want to build on top of it. And then we send that out to fabrication um, while we start working on the rest of the robot. So uh, day three, the drivetrain design is done and we move on to other things and let that uh, process start rolling. Um, and that way, actually, it's not really mentioned here, but day 14, all the drivetrain parts are back. They get assembled and they get wired up. So we have, we build two practice robots. So we have three full robot bases wired up on the third weekend of, of build season. So day 14 or whatever. Um, and it's really important that we do that for the rest of our schedule because our designers, our students that are doing all the CAD, they need the bandwidth to be able to design all these fancy mechanisms that we're gonna put on top of it. So the easier we can make the drivetrain and the faster we can get that done, the more bandwidth and man hours we have to devote to the mechanisms. And when a push comes to shove, your drivetrain is not gonna win you a regional. All right, your mechanisms on top of your drivetrain are what's going to win you a regional. Your drivetrain can definitely lose you a regional. All right, if you build a swerve drive and you don't know how to control it, you're probably going to lose. All right, but that swerve drive isn't going to win you the event. What's going to win you the event is the stuff you put on top of it. So we want to spend as much time designing the stuff on top of it. And let's face it, the stuff on top of the drivetrain is way cooler than the drivetrain itself. All right. Um, Ah, so actually that's day, that's, I should have said that's day two actually, that's a typo. Um, day two is a strategy freeze. Remember I talked about the what's, right? W once you have your list of what's, that's your strategy and it's boom, locked up, you're done. Okay, actually can I go back for one second? There's another, with the strategy freeze, I just want to bring up the power in the strategy freeze and why you read the rules first, okay? Um, in 2014, uh, who's around in 2014? All right, a couple people, awesome. Okay, um, do you remember how teams were taking the ball and passing it from like the first robot that was kind of like the inbounder, right? And they passed it to the second robot and then that second robot would take the ball, shoot it over the truss diagonally to the human player, human player would catch the ball, they'd load that up into the third robot and that third robot would finish, right? And that kind of developed into like the typical cycle, okay? Well, we had that strategy figured out the first day of build season, right? We get to Inland Empire and we're rocking that strategy and we kind of cleaned house on that event and teams thought it was illegal to shoot the ball to the human player, right? There were, half the event thought it was illegal to shoot the ball diagonally across the truss and to the human player who caught the ball and then loaded it safely into the third robot, all right? But we knew it wasn't illegal. We read the rules and we knew this was a sound strategy and we had been practicing that strategy for two plus weeks with our practice robot, okay? Um, huge advantages to coming up with your strategy first and then designing your robot afterwards, after you know what you're going to try to accomplish. Um, I cannot emphasize that enough. Have a strategy freeze early on before you start talking about what you're actually, or how you're going to actually do it. Um, we're usually doing drivetrain controls. Um, after the drivetrains are all wired up, we give the programmers the drive bases and they start doing all the auto routines and stuff like that. Um, let's see. Mechanism construction is happening during that point, I think. Oh yeah, so day 15. So after the, all the drive chassis are wired up, we give them to the programming team because they can start developing autonomous routines without having the rest of the robot. And here's, here's a great example of that. In 2011, it was the year where you were hanging tubes on the rack, right? And, uh, or I guess the wall or whatever they're called, rungs. Um, but your robots had to start like 20 feet away. And there was this tape line that you could follow to get all the way to where you were going to hang the tubes. And you could kind of use the tape line to line yourself up. And this was before we had good software, so we couldn't really drive a robot straight. We didn't really know how to do that. But we knew how to use little line sensors. So 
uh, we had a ro we had our drivetrain done maybe the third week of build season or something like that, and we gave the programmers just the drivetrain and the three little line sensors that they had on the floor. And before we had built the arm or the tube hanger or anything like that, they had the drive base and they just got the drive base to drive forward, follow the line, stop where it knew it had to score, and just kind of sit there for a couple seconds and then turn around and go the other way. And then once we had an arm built, we just slapped the arm on top of it and then just put a couple more lines of code in there to actually release the tube. And then we had a working autonomous mode. But but we had most of it done before we ever had a, ro a full robot to test it on, okay? And we did that because we have a drive chassis early and we could do, we could kind of assume what, how the robot is going to behave for some of it and get a lot of it done beforehand. Um, mechanism integration, but our big, the big thing I want to take away is we try to have our robot finished by the uh, end of week four, so kind of the fifth weekend. Uh, and I say finished because our robots are never actually finished, and hopefully your robot is never actually finished because there's always ways to improve. But we try to have essentially like your rough draft in an essay. We try to have the rough draft of our robot done by the fourth week of build season. And that gives us time to start testing, breaking, and iterating. All right. Um, I cannot emphasize this aspect of our robot design enough. You need to build your robot early, all right? Um, trust me, I was on a team in high school and I remember getting the robot built kind of by like the night before ship and then our programmers would be up all night trying to get some basic functionality on the robot. Maybe you've had a similar experience in the past, all right? It's not a fun place to be. Build your robot much quicker. Cut some corners and get things done fast. It gives you more time to test fail and fix things. I, I have a little bit of a rant right now, and uh, actually I have golden rule number four, which is not on here because I came up with it a couple of months ago. Um, but, and maybe I stole it, I don't know. I, I say I came up with it, but I probably stole it from someone else. Um, the, the motto on 1678, golden rule number four is fail faster, okay? Um, so I don't, I don't pretend to be perfect, and our students, don't pretend to be perfect. We all mess up. We make a ton of mistakes during the build season. All right. But if you, and we're all going to fail at one point or another and probably many, many times. All right. But the difference I think between the teams that win and the teams that don't is the teams that win failed faster and they failed earlier than the teams that don't win. All right. Uh, great example or not a great example, uh, um, uh, kind of a, yeah, I guess an example. Example of this or uh, something to think about is I really don't think 254 is great because they just have this like brain hive of NASA engineers and the brain hive kind of comes up with something and they poop out a robot, right? That's not the way they work, okay? If they, they win because they fail 100 times before they get to the competition and you've only failed 10 times before you got there, okay? Long story short, that's what it comes down to, is they figured out all the ways that their intake could fail weeks before you figured out that your intake failed in your second qualification match on the field, okay? 254's intakes aren't perfect, they, they jam up. 254 shooters don't work the first time, all right? They get stalled. 254 is miss, missing shots left and right in their shop, okay? But they miss them in their shop, they don't miss them out in the field because they fail more often than you or I do. Okay, and we're, I mean, we're, we're trying to keep up, but it's hard. You gotta fail more. You gotta assume the worst in your designs and take it to the breaking point, find out where it's gonna fail, fix that failure point, because now that's one less way your mechanism is gonna fail when you get onto the field. But if you, if you find yourself not failing, if you're like, oh, built is going pretty well, or a robot hasn't broken a single time, maybe you're just not driving it hard enough, all right? Uh, a great example, we, we finally got our drivetrains built this year. I was really excited because there's all these defenses and stuff like that, but I wanted to see if they were actually like built semi-well. And so I just started like throwing the robots at the defenses. I mean, I would, I would push them with a running start straight at the rock wall and watch it jump five feet afterwards. The kids are like crying. They're like, I can't believe you're doing this to our robot, right? It's like, no, you need to find out if it's gonna break now so that it doesn't break when you get to competition, okay? Turns out it was built fairly well and there was only some minor things to adjust. But I mean, the, the, the story of it is, you're paying a lot of money for these regional matches and you're trying to do your best. You want to get that blue banner. You want to fail a ton in your shop. You want to find every way that your robot can possibly break. Break it in the shop. Don't break it out on the field. Don't fail out on the field. Fail faster. Fail more often. All right. Um, experience is really just a bunch of failure points. All right. So if you find yourself with four years of experience, you're a senior on the team. All right. You're, you're at an advantage just because you fail more often than your peers frankly put. I mean, I view my last 14 years in FRC as a 
history of failures that have gotten 1678 to the point where they're at right now. I mean, it's, it's all about failing as often as you can, as fast as you can, and learning from those failures so you can build a better robot. You're not perfect, your team's not perfect, don't assume your design is perfect, take it to the breaking point, and further and then fix it from there and make it better the next time all right because you got to you got to go into a you got to go into it knowing that other teams are going to fail faster than you will and you got to keep up you got to keep testing keep iterating keep fixing things rebuilding it uh, making it better that's what goes into making a good team so <coughs> fail faster Whew, okay um First thing I want to address is there's a big lie in FRC that there's a six week build season. All right, some of you are laughing because you recognize that. Some of you might be like, the build season is not six weeks long. What are they talking about? The build season never ends. All right, and I hope the teams here realize that. But um, if you haven't noticed, most teams just don't stop when build when stop build day hits. They got a second robot and they just keep going. All right, the the build season carries all the way through championships for 1678. We don't change our schedule because of stop build day. We have a consistent meeting schedule from January 7th until what is it like April 20th this year or whenever Houston Champs is over. Um, here's one great way to take advantage of a never ending build season. It's the called the withholding allowance. All right, and it's something that's been in the rules over the last maybe six years i don't know i'm not a great frc historian but um the withholding allowance states that you're allowed to bring a certain weight of custom machine parts into the event uh outside of your bag okay and what that means is um it allows you to keep back keep back mechanisms um in order to refine them so uh, a great example from this year could be like if you weren't sure if your shooter was really dialed in maybe you had a catapult and you wanted to figure out what the perfect like pressure air pressure was and geometry was and you don't think you got it quite right maybe you put your roll on the bag but you take your catapult off right and you mount it to a piece of plywood and then you just keep taking shots right and you keep fine-tuning until you get just the right shot that you want and then when you get to the competition uh, you take your robot out of the bag without a catapult you bring your catapult in because it weighs less than 30 pounds and you slap it back on the robot all right um, I this slide says last resort don't rely on this I don't know who wrote that it wasn't me uh, but uh, that's baloney you should absolutely use the withholding allowance to improve anything and everything that you can uh, great example of this uh, going to go back to 1670 in 2013 uh, the frisbee shooting year our first trip to Einstein it was great but the robot that we competed with at champs was completely different from the robot that we competed with at our first event Central Valley Regional we went to the Central Valley Regional and we got extremely lucky and we happened to from the sixth seed win that event and qualify for the championship but our robot was terrible we actually played defense most of the elimination matches okay because our shooter didn't work very well our intake didn't work very well and so uh, the team looked at the robot and the state of it after Central Valley and we said you know what this shooter is just abysmal we need to fix something because we were burning through Bainbot's wheels like at once every two matches the Bainbot's wheels were tearing themselves apart we were missing shots left and right and so after Central Valley we were like well you know what 973 had a pretty good shooter at Central Valley right and start looking at some Google images and uh, we totally copied 973 shooter in 20 like the same geometry. I think maybe we changed the trigger system a little bit, but everything was the same. You guys had a great robot that year. Um, so we copied their shooter, and then at Sacramento, we're using pretty much 973 shooter slapped onto our robot. But then we're like, crap, you know, like that event went okay. We had a couple other issues, but our intake is still terrible, right? And we're going to championships. We can't go to championships with this intake. We had a good idea, but it didn't pan out. And then we're like, well, you know what? 254 has a pretty nice intake. Let's check that out. So again, go to images, find 254 pictures of 254's robot. Uh, Tau Tower remembers this. We made some, remember that we made the plywood sandwich and we had some power drills and we made a couple rollers and we figured out some geometry that worked. And then we put together a brand new intake for championship and slapped it on. Both those mechanisms were each under 30 pounds and we brought those to two different events. And so it was 100% legit. And we had pretty much a brand new robot at championship. It was almost 100% different than it was a, at our first event. And actually the hanging mechanism completely changed too between Central Valley and Champs. So that is a, I'd say probably one of the more extreme examples. 2015 last, or 973 last year, you guys are a good example of your robot getting completely overhauled. I mean, they were way more extreme than we were in 2013. And But their robot was great at championships. They had one of the best robots there. It was an amazing stacking robot. Um, but it took them 
It's true. You guys had a great robot that year. Do you argue? No? You guys had a good robot, all right? Just some unfortunate luck. Um, <laughs> practice robot. OK, um, so practice robots, like we were talking about just a second ago, they're a huge advantage to a team. So I, I encourage you to try to aim for a practice robot, maybe not next year, maybe the year after, but it's something to build towards as a team. Now, um, let's see. Uh, okay, I do mention it here. Okay, so I have kind of a, like a cheat sheet. It uses the withholding allowance and another quick like cheat to get a practice robot without actually even having to use CAD, frankly. Okay, here's the, here's the deal. You decide right now as a team that you're gonna use the Andy Mark drive base. Okay, just decide right now. If you're a team that struggles building a practice robot, use the Andy Mark kit chassis next season. Okay, here's why. You build the AndyMark kit base, you go onto AndyMark.com, you buy another AndyMark kit base, boom, you built a practice robot. It's that easy. And then you take your mechanism, whatever you build on top of it, and once bag day comes, you take your mechanism off, you put it onto your other drive base, you bag the AndyMark kit base, or maybe you just bag the one you haven't even touched yet, right? You bag one of them, I don't care which one you bag, and you have the other uh, drive base with your mechanism on top of it. Both drive bases are identical because AndyMark is selling 3,000 of them, right? And they make them all the same. Uh, and now you have a practice robot. And hopefully your mechanism is fairly light, but there's a chance that it's either at 30 pounds or maybe a little bit over, but with motors. And you can pull the motors off, and those are COTS parts, so they don't count. There's a lot of fancy withholding allowance stuff that we don't have time to get into right now, but you can make that work. And now you have a full practice robot while still only building one set of mechanism parts. Do you guys see how that worked? Mm -hmm. Because you have two identical drive bases, so they're going to behave exactly the same. Bumpers don't count. You don't have to bag your bumpers, so you can keep using your bumpers at your shop even past bag day. Okay, a lot of things can go in your favor where you can have. Hey, you guys built a practice robot last year, right? No. No. Oh, okay. Well, I'm. Right? No. No. Okay. Well, never mind. All right. Well, uh, I I think this is a great way to go about it, and I know some teams will like throw up at the idea of using the AndyMark kit base, and I will. I will give in and say that it was a pretty bad drive base for 2016 because it just couldn't get over half the defenses. But in a given year, especially if it's a flat field or a semi-flat field, the AndyMark drive base is going to be plenty for your team. It's already designed. You're going to save a ton of time and you can have a fully functional practice robot, maybe for the first time in your team history by just following these couple, uh, these couple of steps here. Okay. Another thing to do during the competition season is watch other competitions. You can learn a lot just by watching other regionals. In California, we don't have any week one events this year uh, in 2017, which means that there's week one events happening across the country and across the world that you can watch and gain information about how to play the 2017 game. Um, something that I used to do with the team, uh, the team's too big now, but I used to have the team all over to my like small college apartment and uh, we'd shove all the kids onto like five couches and uh, we just cook up a bunch of pancakes and watch like five regionals all day, right? And it gives all of our students a really strong idea about how the game is played without ever going to an event, okay? And then we go into maybe our week two or week three regional and we already know some of the strong strategies that are being played and it gives us a big leg up on some of the competition that has no idea how the game's gonna play out. Um, there's also a lot of great information and discussion happening on Chief Delphi. There's some people that aren't worth listening to, but there's a couple smart people on there. Um, volunteering for events is another great way to, uh, to learn about the game and about the way the game's playing out. There's a lot of regionals, especially in Northern California this year. We have a new one in San Francisco being hosted by 5924. Um, so there's four regionals in California, and I'm betting that your team isn't going to all four of them. So consider volunteering at one of them. Maybe you're a uh, volunteer uh, field reset or something like that, and it gives you some more up close and personal experience with the robots at that event, and you can learn a lot from that. And maybe, maybe you copy 973 Shooter, I don't know. Um, uh, let's see here. At the competition, a couple of notes for what to do at the competition. Make sure your team is scouting in some form or another. I don't care if it's just paper and pencil, but do some sort of data acquisition on the teams competing at your event. Okay. Uh, and the reason why this is important, uh, for two reasons. One, if you're in a picking position as one of the top teams at the event, it gives you the knowledge you need to create what's called a pick list of the teams that you want to play with. And then you can uh, pick the best teams on your pick list to join your alliance. 
But even more so, something that a lot of teams don't do, but I highly suggest you do, is use your scouting data to inform your match strategy during the qualification matches and the elimination matches. What I mean by that is after a couple, let's say, um, let's say all the teams have played like two or three matches, our scouts are taking data on all the teams. On 1678, our scouts take data on tablets. That data gets uploaded to a, a server on on the web, in the cloud. And then uh, I have a fancy iPhone app on my phone that I can download all that information and I can get like match summaries. And so I know for any given match, the stats on all six teams. What's their percentage of shots made in the high goal? How many high goals do they make on average each match? How many low goals do they make on average each match? Um, and we have things like you know notes, like robot broke down or robot flipped over, stuff like that. We keep track of all that stuff. and so. One of the unfortunate things in FRC is teams have a tendency to over-exaggerate their capabilities. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? You guys all chuckle, right? Uh, a team says, oh yeah, you know, I, I'm, I can't remember. I think we either score on average 12 goals in the high goal or 20 goals in the high goal every match. I, I can't remember which one, but it's one of those two, right? Just trust me, okay? Um, and I don't, I don't suppose, I don't, I'm not saying that there's any ill intent there, but I think teams just assume that they're better than they actually are with the data. And so it's important to evaluate the team's objective performance based off your scouting data. And so when I go into match strategy with a couple other teams and we're talking over who's gonna do what, it's important that we build a solid strategy for the whole alliance, not just one team. And that means looking at the objective data and deciding what the best roles are best roles are for each robot on our alliance, as well as the best way to defeat the opposing alliance. So which robot is the one that can score the most high goals? Let's try to play defense on that robot, stuff like that. Scouting data is great, not just for your pick list. It's great for developing your match strategy. So if that's, that's one thing I could really um, suggest you guys add to your, uh, your competition flow. Um, a couple notes about pit management. It's really important to stay organized in the pit so you can have access to tools and parts quickly. Um, so uh, if you don't have a tool chest, invest in a tool chest where you can organize your tools. If you don't have parts bins to maybe organize your spare parts or like your fasteners, your bolts and nuts, invest in some of those things and label things so that anyone in your pit can find something fairly quickly. It'll help you out in the long run. Um, a really important thing to keep in mind is battery management. This may be obvious to you, but I highly recommend assigning one person to manage all of your batteries throughout the whole event and they are the person responsible for putting a fresh battery in the robot every match make sure there's someone that's responsible that your team can count on because I can't tell you the number of times I've seen a robot on at one of their qualification matches at a regional they get out there they're driving for about half the match and then the robot kind of slows down a little bit and slows down to a stop and then they're gone for the rest of the match. You're know, like, what happened? It's like, oh, they left the battery in from the match before, right? Uh, that's, that's a bummer, but it's especially a bummer because they paid $5,000 for that regional and they have 10 matches and they just burned a $500 match, okay? So make sure you have someone managing the batteries at, uh, at your pit. Um, and make sure your team members have a way to stay in contact with each other. I can't count the number of times where I'm like, where's the driver? I don't know. I think he went to the bathroom. I think he's over there. Make sure you guys are all on the same page, okay? Um, lastly, I just robots don't win competitions. Teams do. That's why training right now is incredibly important. The work you do in the fall to build up your team now, to develop your best practices, to set a schedule for your build season and competition season, to make sure your team is on the same page and developing the skills they need come kickoff. Um, that's what's going to make a solid season, all right? You need to build the team now so that you can build a good robot uh, when the time comes. Uh, if you guys have any questions, you can email me at corsetto at gmail.com. It's really easy to remember, just my last name at gmail. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. You can also find me tomorrow if you want to. I'll be around, uh, floating around the event. I'm happy to answer any questions then. It's already past seven, so unfortunately we got to end right now. I'll be around for a couple minutes to answer questions. Uh, thank you everyone for your time. I really appreciate it.